Welcome back. Chapters 26 and 27 form a narrative transition between Don Quixote's penance and two major events. First, the arrival in the Sierra Morena of the Hidalgo's friends, the priest and the barber. Second, the conclusion of Cardenio's tale. Moreover, in terms of the total number of chapters of the 1605 novel, we have reached the halfway point. As if to underscore this, chapter 26 begins with a description of Don Quixote doing penance, his bottom half naked and his top half clothed. As we saw in chapter 1, our hero is confused by a number of examples of chivalric heroes. Apparently, this confusion is the same as it ever was. Once again, he pondered that which he had pondered on so many other occasions without ever resolving the issue. His indecision has two interesting aspects. First, Don Quixote wrestles with the eternal problem of the proper Spanish perspective on the historic battle of Roncesvalles in 778. He is concerned about his urge to identify with Roland, the French general, because Bernardo del Carpio, the Basque Leonese hero, offers a more victorious option. Second, and even more interesting, leaving aside the matter of courage, he is concerned about the love aspect of Roland's story because his lady Angelica had slept more than two siestas with Medoro, a young Moor with curly hair. The vexing problem of racial purity again. And here, unlike in the previous chapter, Don Quixote cannot stomach the possibility of miscegenation. But how can I imitate him in his madness if I cannot imitate him in its cause? For my Dulcinea, I would venture to swear, has never laid eyes on a single more in all the days of her life. At this point, if the reader is not confused by Don Quixote's contradictions regarding the supposed sexual and blood purity of his beloved, then she has not been reading with attention. In the end, Don Quixote decides to imitate Amadis, and abruptly, his national and ethnic anxieties give way to the issue of religious orthodoxy. The knight's problem is that in order to imitate Amadis, he will need a rosary, which he does not have. But he finds a solution. He tore a long strip from his shirt tails, which were hanging at hand, and he made 11 knots in it, the first fatter than the others. And this served as his rosary during his time there, in which he prayed a million Hail Marys. The modern reader might not understand the extreme blasphemy of this act. We know that this passage offended ecclesiastical authorities because it was censored in the second edition of 1605. Just realize that the shirt tail was used to wipe one's hindquarters after doing what Sancho calls, with a humorous euphemism, number two, aguas mayores. Next, Don Quixote decides to record many lyrical verses on the bark of trees and in the fine sand. Our hero's sacred laments are absurdly pathetic, especially since he follows Dulcinea's name with a forced refrain at the end of each stanza, of El Toboso, which underscores the issue of his beloved's identity. Furthermore, halfway through the poem, the hero affirms his pathos by awkwardly identifying himself with a beast of burden. Love batters him without mercy, like a very bad breed, which suggests that Don Quixote himself is of a low-born caste, racially suspect. <laughs>